So let's say you get a test question and it asks you about a child who comes in with a rash. What type of microorganism can cause this? Unfortunately, there are many bugs that can cause rashes. By using this table, we'll try to differentiate between them. Rubella causes a rash that begins at the head and moves downward. It can also cause post-auricular lymphadenopathy. The rash of measles virus also begins at the head and moves downward. However, in this case, it is often preceded by a cough, coryza, which is basically a head cold, and conjunctivitis, which are the three C's of measles, as well as blue-white spots or coplic spots on buccal mucosa. VZV causes chicken pox, in which the rash will usually begin on the trunk and spread to the face and extremities. What's important to keep in mind with chicken pox is that lesions will appear to be of different age, so some lesions will appear to be new while some appear to be older. HHV6 can cause roseola, which is a macular rash over the entire body. This usually appears several days after a high fever and usually affects infants. Parvovirus B19 can cause erythema infectiosum, which is also called slap cheek disease due to the red rash seen on the cheeks of patients. Strep pyogenes causes scarlet fever, which is an erythematous sandpaper-like rash with fever and sore throat. Lastly, Coxsackie virus type A causes hand, foot, and mouth disease, which is a vesicular rash on the palms and soles. It also can cause ulcers in the oral mucosa. We've already covered each of the sexually transmitted diseases earlier in these talks, but let's go through them now as a group. Gonorrhea is caused by Neisseria gonorrhea. Symptoms include urethritis, cervicitis, pelvic inflammatory disease, prostatitis, epididymitis, arthritis, and a creamy purulent discharge. Syphilis is caused by treponema pallidum and progresses through three stages. Primary syphilis is characterized by a painless canker, while secondary syphilis often presents with fever, lymphadenopathy, skin rashes, and condylomata. Tertiary syphilis is a later stage of the disease and can present with gummas, tabes dorsalis, general paresis, aortitis, and argyle robertson pupil. Cancroid is caused by Haemophilus ducrii and presents with a painful genital ulcer and inguinal adenopathy. As mentioned before, you can remember that the ulcers are painful by remembering that with ducrii, you do cry. Genital herpes is caused by HSV2 and presents with painful penile, vulvar, or cervical vesicles. It can also cause systemic symptoms such as fever, headache, and myalgia. Chlamydia is caused by Chlamydia trachomotis, and in particular, the D serotype. It presents with urethritis, cervicitis, conjunctivitis, Reiter syndrome, and pelvic inflammatory disease. Rider syndrome is also known as reactive arthritis, and it can also include urethritis and conjunctivitis. The mnemonic to remember riders is that you cannot see, can't pee, and cannot climb a tree, referring to conjunctivitis, urethritis, and arthritis. The L1 through L3 serotypes of chlamydia trachomotis can cause lymphogranuloma venereum, which presents with genital ulcers, lymphadenopathy, and rectal structures. Trichomoniasis is caused by the protozoan Trichomonas vaginalis. This presents with vaginitis and strawberry-colored mucosa. On a wet prep, you'll see corkscrew motility with this infection. Possibly the most infamous sexually transmitted disease, AIDS, is caused by the virus HIV. As you surely know by now, this can make patients more susceptible to opportunistic infections and also can cause Kaposi sarcoma and lymphoma. HPV viruses 6 and 11 can cause condylomata acuminata, which is basically genital warts, with coilocytes visible on microscopy. Hepatitis B virus is basically the only sexually transmitted hepatitis virus. Its most notable presenting symptom is jaundice. Lastly, Gardnerella vaginalis is not really a sexually transmitted disease, but it is included here for the sake of contrast. Bacterial vaginosis is non-inflammatory and causes a malodorous discharge with a fishy smell. It is diagnosed by a whiff test and the presence of clue cells on microscopy. On a similar note, the sexually transmitted diseases, chlamydia and Neisseria gonorrhea, both cause pelvic inflammatory disease. Chlamydia trachomotis is the most common bacterial STD in the United States, so it's important to be familiar with PID. PID is characterized by cervical motion tenderness and a purulent cervical discharge. It may also include salpingitis, which is inflammation of the fallopian tubes, endometritis, 
hydrosalpinx, which is a distally blocked fallopian tube filled with serous or clear fluid, as well as tubo ovarian abscesses. If left untreated, it can cause fitzhugh Curtis syndrome, which is an infection of the liver capsule that shows as violin string adhesions of the parietal peritoneum to the liver. The salpingitis caused by PID is a risk factor for ectopic pregnancy, infertility, chronic pelvic pain, and adhesions. On this slide is a list of infections you're most likely to get from being in the hospital. CMV and RSV are very common in newborn nurseries. E. coli and proteus can both be acquired through urinary catheterization, and pseudomonas can also be acquired through respiratory therapy equipment. Hepatitis B virus can be transmitted via renal dialysis. Candida can be transmitted by hyperalimentation or overfeeding, and Legionella can be transmitted by water aerosols, such as those found in ventilation systems. It is important to note that E. coli and Staph aureus are the two most common causes of nosocomial infections. Also, if you ever see a burn victim, make sure to think about Pseudomonas. And likewise, when a water source is involved, think about Legionella. Here's a list of bugs that can infect unimmunized children. As far as the step one is concerned, you should probably only suspect these if the question states that the child is from another country or has not received immunizations. The pathogens that can cause rash include rubella and measles virus. Meningitis can be caused by H. influenza type B as well as poliovirus. Pharyngitis can be caused by Corynebacterium diphtheria and epiglottitis can be caused by H. flu type B. We've covered the physical and lab findings earlier in these talks, so I won't go over those again here. This final slide of the system section of first aid microbiology is probably the most important one for your test. It's very high yield to remember the associations between the pathogens listed on the right and some things they're associated with listed on the left. If a patient has pus, empyema, or abscess, think of Staph aureus. Haemophilus influenza can cause pediatric infections, and Pseudomonas is most common in patients with cystic fibrosis or in burn victims. If a question mentions sulfur granules, you should think about actinomyces. Patients with traumatic open wounds are susceptible to Clostridium perfringens, which can cause gas gangrene whereas those with surgical wounds are susceptible to Staph aureus infections. Pasteurella can be caused by a dog or cat bite. Any patient with red currant jelly sputum likely has a Klebsiella infection. If you see a positive PAS stain, you should definitely think of Whipple's disease. Group B strep affects babies, so if you see sepsis or meningitis in a newborn, think about this form of strep. Healthcare providers can be susceptible to hepatitis B virus from a needle stick. Fungal infections in diabetics can be caused by mucor or rhizopus infections. If you encounter an asplenic patient, keep the shin bacteria in mind, which are strep pneumonia, H. flu type B, and Neisseria meningitis. Chronic granulomatous disease can be caused by catalase positive microbes. Neutropenic patients are susceptible to candida infections and aspergillus. And if you see a patient with bilateral Bell's palsy, make sure to think about Lyme disease or Borrelia burgdorferi. Remember the mnemonic, bake a key lime pie, which stands for Bell's palsy, arthritis, cardiac block, and erythema migraines, which can all be caused by Borrelia burgdorferi.